Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest Alamita Papula. And she's here today to talk to us about her new book, When We Speak of Nothing. Now, Alamita is a London based Nigerian German writer and speaker who presents internationally. Her publications also include critical essays, hybrid pieces, and poetry. Alamita holds a PhD in creative writing, an MA in creative writing, and a BS in Ayurvedic medicine. So let's welcome to the show Alamita. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, what a joy it is to have you here. And my goodness, what a profound book. And I think some people are going, you know, it's a little progressive, while others are saying, hey, it's about time we have a book like this. <laughs> I think uh, I think it's about time as well. But also, we need to sort of imagine a little bit ahead as, as artists and as writers. We can't just stay in the now. So perhaps for some people, it's a bit ahead. But I think that's our role in, in the scheme of things, Yeah, to be visionaries in some ways, you know? Well, your, your book definitely shines a light on quite a few topics. But before we get into that too much, I would love for you to share with our listeners what started you on this background and, you know, as far as your path and what inspired you to become a writer? Um. Yes, I grew up in Germany, and I just know that I, as soon as I started to learn writing, which was age six, that's when we start school in Germany, I wanted to become a writer. And I can't say exactly what happened. I guess it was I was always fascinated by stories, and my imagination was already really developed. And when I realized that someone was actually writing these things, and I think when that's why when I started to learn to write and I put the two, two together or made the connection, that's when I knew and I proclaimed I was going to be a writer right then and there. And here we are. <laughs> All these years later, well, we're so glad. I mean, this isn't your first writing accomplishment. You have a few others under your belt as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so this is my fourth book. So I wrote a short novel called This Not About Sadness. I wrote a play that was published also by mail and a short story collection, Breach. Um, and also before that, I did a lot of spoken word. I did a lot of poetry. I had a lot of poems published. Um, and yeah, I did that for quite a while until I started with fiction. Now, I understand you did the research for this book as part of some of your continuing, some of the education that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did it as my PhD project. It's called, um, so it's a practical based research PhD, so which I finished. I have my doctorate now. Mm -hmm. And it basically meant that the novel was the, the biggest part of it. And then I also had to write a critical or theoretical part to go with it. But it also meant that I wrote a novel based on research objectives and research questions. So that's perhaps why there's a lot of issues in there, because I had to sort of juggle a lot of theory in my head as well. And that sort of found a way into the novel not as theory as you know this novel is very um colloquial so it's not heavy in that sense but in terms of addressing a lot of different issues yeah because i know your book talks about friendship it talks mm -hmm. about um transgender it has a yeah. lot of um of just information in there although those aren't some of the main parts that friendship is mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that was sort of the drive. And what happened is that some of the things happened while I was writing. So, for instance, it addresses the London riots, which then became sort of a national riots. They happened in 2011, and they were sparked by the killing of a black man by the police in Tottenham, which is in North London. That was never a part of my plan because it hadn't happened. But I was in the middle of the beginning of the novel. And then the riots happened and I was working in a community center that had a lot of young people. So I was watching, especially these young men, possibly going and participating in the riots. So there was sort of no way that I could write a novel that was set in the now in the contemporary world in London and exactly where the riots were taking place and not sort of take that on board. So, yeah, yeah that's how it, some of the things came about by accident. Well, it's interesting because the things that you talk about I think are why so many people resonate with your work. It doesn't matter what country you're in. We're kind of all dealing with some of the same issues. Mm, yeah, definitely in the U.S. in the last 
at least a couple of years, it's really, that's certainly a topic with Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. et cetera, that a lot of these things are happening, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you were doing your research for this book, how long did it take you? There are different elements to it, obviously. So there's a part where research, for instance, about transgender and um, we met somebody, but also um, you know, I had people in my environment already, but also looked up organizations. That was probably fairly quick and easy because it's sort of straightforward. But I also went to Nigeria, to the Niger Delta, and um, yeah, researched there because I part of the novel place there. And I knew I had to go there to make the scene convincing. And that obviously took a lot of preparation. It takes money to go there. Um, I had to make contacts with you know, journalists that then passed me on to activists in the area. And it was quite an exciting time. And I realized I am not made to be an investigative journalist, that it's quite, <laughs> um, that's a different type of work. But it was exciting, and I'm glad I did it. And it definitely made the novel very much richer. If I hadn't gone, I wouldn't have been able to bring it to life in the same way. Well, it's interesting. Well, you know, with people who do investigative journalism, I mean, they really, um, you know, kind of put their life on the line many times to get the story. Yeah, that's, um, I had a, you know what, I had a hairy conversation and that's why I know. Uh, I had a, had one hairy conversation that could have gone really wrong. And I was also very aware that I was quite exposed that some of the things that I was looking at were perhaps things that were supposed to be shielded or hidden from the public view. Mm -hmm. And I remember exactly standing in the, boiling heat, sun beating down on me thinking, I'm not made, I'm not made for this because it's scary. But um, at the same time, I wasn't putting my, my, my life on the line, definitely not. But, um, you know, it wasn't 100% safe. It's not the same as doing research on the computer or doing a couple of interviews. Well, yeah, it's a, a whole different, whole different world. Well, yeah. and I love how in your book you there's you know some of the narrations done in regards to uh, spirit, and I'd love for you to share what that was inspired by. There's a Yoruba god. So Yoruba is an ethnicity in Nigeria, which is my ethnicity or my father's ethnicity, and the Yoruba have a very rich um, traditional religion, um, and they're based on these different deities and gods and the god of the crossroad is called Ishu and he's and sometimes described as a trickster god and he's a very interesting figure because he he puts things in people's pathway also the myths go or the mythology goes so that you have to figure something out and then arrive at the next level and in some ways arrive at the next level of your humanity so on first instance it looks just like an annoyance that something is not going smoothly but once you labor through the obstacle you arrive somewhere else so it was a good metaphor for some of the things that happen in the friendship and some of the things that happen for the characters and their personal growth but also he's a god that is described as androgynous and shape-shifting and if we so i did a lot of research around issue because it was a phd so i did a lot of theory theoretical research so if we were looking at this god issue with contemporary gender theory we could definitely see a connection to sort of queer issues or even trans issues. So I also sort of used him as a symbol or as a patron for the issues that come up in this, this regard in the novel. And he's the narrator of the whole thing, but it's quite subtle. You would, it's only a few times that he addresses the reader directly, and um, there's a lot of references to issue, but you would have to know to find them that's they're subtle and built in into the landscape really of the novel well i love how you have not just these subtle um references but they really mean so much and when you peel that back and look at the you know the meaning behind it it really is quite profound well thank you mm -hmm. you, you did a very good job at that it, it takes a lot of um, obviously writing skill to do that. So you're the right person to write this book. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you. It was great fun too, but it, it takes a while to sort of find everything. The other thing is that it, everything sort of comes together, but it takes a while until that happens. Because issues are also concerned with lang language and stands for language. So one of the things you've probably noticed that is very, is the language that I use in the book. 
mm-hmm. and it, it shifts as well. It does, it's not very formal. It doesn't really adhere to conventions how people write novels. And once I found it, she actually gave me a lot of freedom to do all these different things because he's a trickster, he's a shapeshifter, he works with language. And sometimes it just needs, you need something like that. And then everything else falls into place in terms of structure and approach or even point of view and narration. Well, I think that the language part makes this a, a book for everybody because it's it's true to form when it when we're dealing with people with different dialects and um, you know different ways of speaking. They can pick up this book and feel like it's speaking to them. That's great to hear because sometimes, uh, yeah, I think so too. But also sometimes people need a minute to get into it because um, you need to really hear them. But I've had such great responses and especially from people who are completely opposite or very far away from the main characters who are two young black boys, you know, 17 year olds in urban scape in, in London and very London, they're London boys. But I've heard, especially from quite a few middle-aged white women how that voice rang so true for them and that they felt so close to these two boys and I thought that's a job done if you can really inhabit that character although they have nothing in common with you in some ways and that's a a trait of excellent writing is what that is (laughs) 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 so you know was there any part of your research or the work that you do with uh, I know you've you work with the young people, I believe. Um, was yeah. there any part of that that inspired any of the characters in the book? Yes. Um, watching young men, um, especially the young men, not the young women, maybe because I have been a young woman, so I felt closer to that. But I was watching, I, watched, I worked in a um, center quite a long time, and watching these young men conduct a friendship, there was something very um, impressive. I was really impressed because... They're sort of coolish, you know, pretty, you know, like cool, they look all good, they talk the talk, but they have the real tenderness uh, and the real loyalty towards each other. And that really inspired me to, to write this book. And that's essentially what it's about, about Carl and Abu's friendship. And it comes from that. And I had particularly um, young men in in mind, or now that I'm speaking, who come to mind straight away, but it wasn't much modeled on them so the characters itself are not modeled on them but this idea of how they conduct each other Mm -hmm. um and how they were very careful and very gentle and very sweet with each other and it's also something that we hardly see in the media about how black boys especially black young men how they're not just a nuisance or they're not just disruptive but how tender they are um so yeah that was definitely a driving factor for me. I think All we need to see more work. of that for sure, you know, because yeah. um, I think um, there, there are certain things that are um, miscategorized when we think about people. And I, um, and I just think it's kind of time to set the record straight. Yes, and you would have noticed there's no real gangs in my book and stuff. Yes, I call them the wannabes, and it sounds like a gang, but it's just, in a way, local bullies, because we have those stories a lot. Estates, or, you know, I don't know what estates are called in the U.S., but, you know, these places where people of lower income might live, and then you have gang violence and all of that stuff there. But there's a whole lot of other stuff going on. People are just sort of going on their, their normal life. Um, yeah, and living their life, and there's so much to see there. I think also for especially black men themselves, as they are trying to become men, they need a variety of role models or, or portrayals that they can model themselves against. No, oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Well, and you know, I'm kind of toggling to another topic here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because I know that. When we talk about transgender, that's kind of um, something that hasn't really been written about a whole lot as far as novels Mm -hmm. are concerned. And I'd love for you to share with us how London is changing regarding the LGBTQ community, how that looks. London itself? Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I feel that in the UK, we have the awareness around 
trans issues has definitely grown a lot in the last few years. I did start the novel before that happened, and then it just seemed to be having an implosion. We had a lot of TV programs and a lot of awareness. Um, London, yeah, London itself is a very, I want to say, LGBTQ friendly city. There's lots of interesting things going on. But I think what I also think is that sometimes we forget that it doesn't mean everybody's on board. Not everybody actually thinks we deserve all the rights that we have in terms of LGBTs. So it's a difficult question because, of course, people are protected here by the law. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cultural stuff going on. There's a lot of programs and media awareness, uh, media coverage. But you have, you, you have corners of the city where you might not want to come out um, or where you would be careful. And I think that's just a reflection on the society at home that things are, you know, leg legislations or um, laws don't always reflect everything. Yeah. But it's certainly, it's certainly a city where there's a lot of um, visibility for LGBTQs. That's for sure. Right. And it's interesting when we look at like different communities, you know, how some um, aren't really, you know, the perception is that some aren't really open to when people uh, come out, you mm -hmm. know, and so it's interesting, you know, you kind of see a little bit of that impact in the book. Yes. And I wanted to reverse the notion of, because I think sometimes we have that in big cities, you know, in London, now everybody's free here and everybody can sort of actualize themselves. And to some extent that is true. But as, yeah, as I just said earlier, there are some people who are not on board and you can sometimes feel the brunt of that. And that happens in, in, uh, in the novel. And at the same time, in other countries where the laws are not so progressive, you can find a whole host of people who are, you know, who are very supportive and, um, yeah, stand by your side. Well, and, you know, to kind of um, go back to some of the research that you were doing, because your book, it really, I, I found it to be just a really profound read because it does cover so many different topics because we look at gender and race and class and then all these different things are interwoven in it. Was there anything that surprised you when you were doing your research for this book? Huh, that's a good question. Um, not, not really, no, not really. I think I was aware of, so the things around, I know it touches on a lot of issues. Some of them don't seem that much for me. So to have somebody who's um, black, trans and working class, it looks like three separate issues, but at the same time, it's just one person. So that doesn't feel like separate issues to me. It just is woven in into one. I think, of course, things around the Niger Delta, I knew them in theory, but to see them, um, surprise is not the right word. There was a bit of shock, definitely, um, to what the extent of the environmental impact was and how close it was to, to people's lives. And um, so not surprise, but shock. Yeah, Quite, I understand yeah. that for sure. You know, because anytime you look at some kind of, you know, um, environmental issue, especially when it, it's affecting other people and, and uh, region, it's, it's um, you know, a lot of times we don't know as much as we should. You know, and I don't think you can imagine how it looks like if you haven't seen it. Certain things are just, um, yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen the worst. But some of the things were even just what gas flaring is and... Maybe listeners can just look that up rather than me explaining, you know, boring topic. But the first time I saw that, I was like, wow, okay. So it's just a big chimney and there are these huge flames. But then there's a village right there. People just living here. And gas is seeping out. And it was shocking how close the proximities were to, yeah, some of the oil spills. And, yeah, definitely the gas flaring is just in the middle of villages sometimes. Yeah, I think seeing anything like that would just be absolutely heartbreaking because you mm. know people are right there and they're they're having to succumb to that. Yes, exactly. And they sometimes are not informed 
exactly what this might do to them, you know, or what the health impact is. Um, yeah, how yeah. it can look years down the road. Exactly. Well, and so what are some of the takeaways that you want the reader to um, have with your book? I know we've talked about so much, but when when someone reads your book, what, what would you like them to take away from that? I think the first thing that springs to mind is to be really loyal to your friends. If that's your real good friend, stand by their side, and that's mm-hmm. important. And I've noticed since it come came out that for me, this question of loyalty and friendship and comes up a lot. And what does it mean and how I want to conduct myself or how I want others to conduct themselves. And for me, essentially, that's the crux of that, that this sort of how do we love each other and not just in romantic love. So that's one of the things. And I think everything else is sort of categorized under that. Yes, there are the issues that, you know, you can look at through political lens, but they are approached in my mind through the through the friendship and people standing by each other. Even in Nigeria, when Carl has such a welcoming time there, mm-hmm. even though, you know, I think... That comes again because people know how to conduct themselves towards somebody who they want to be a friend with or somebody who they want to have as part of their family. So, yeah, for me, it's a, it's about that. I think sometimes, especially living in, in bigger cities, we can be a little bit fickle. And I think we are old school standing by your friends and loved ones. That's something. Yeah. Well, it's interesting out here, you know, when you get to bigger cities, you do have opportunity to be around a lot more different people. But at the same time, it's sometimes it's difficult to make those connections because there are so many people out here. Yes. I mean, it's the same here. And also you're so busy. Um, Mm -hmm. And then the commute is so long, so you don't have the time necessarily to meet people. It's difficult. Of course it is. But then it's maybe even more important. Or speak to your neighbors. That's always an option. It's so... (laughs) It's so old fashioned, but it's especially in cities improves. I think your your quality of life so much. Well, yeah, at least you can learn about people that live right next door to you. I know most of the communities I've been in, um, they call them backyard communities where people drive into their garage and you don't see them. You know, yeah, because they're in their backyard. <laughs> And I mean, you can't be friends with everybody, but it's so, sometimes it's just about, hey, hello, oh gosh, here you say, oh, it's a scorcher because it's super hot here today. Just that, I mean, everybody's lonely, especially in big cities. So these sort of smaller interactions also make a difference, I think. Oh, and yeah. throughout, through those, we get to those deeper friendships. Oh, I think that's all right, because you just never know, you know, that hello could be the only person they talk to all day. Yes. Um, and I recently had a child, she's now two, and every new mother knows that because all of a sudden your life is so very different and you're very much at home. So I know a lot of my neighbors and it's brilliant. Just a little on the way to the shop having that two-minute two, two minute exchange um, because you're not going out as much. And So I know it from that point of view, but especially older people and I don't want to be an advocate now for we all taking care of each other but I think it does make a difference in our quality of life and well your your book when we speak of nothing really outlines friendship I think at a very deep level and it's such a just a fun and profound read but at the same time it's hitting so many different topics so you know you're kind of enjoying what you're reading but at the same time it's like wow this is some pretty heavy stuff that normally books, um, you know, of this kind of nature wouldn't be so enjoyable to read. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. That's a real compliment. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes we, maybe we, it's not that they're not profound and important issues, but I think we forget that we, even people who live through these issues or confronted by them they still have fun they still love hopefully yeah they still have all these other beautiful things going on in their lives so um that's where i'm driven from i'm very much a thinker i'm very much interested in thinking and talking about issues that we need to address as a society or culturally 
but I also want to have fun. I also want to address the beauty of life. I want to be playful around these things. And I think then it is fun as well that we feel much better doing it. Well, and so, um, you know, I, I kind of am looking at this bigger picture of, of the work you've done. I'm sure you have other books or other writings because someone who writes as profound as you, I'm sure, has something else that they're working on. Right now? Oh, yeah. Yes, I've started the new novel. It is a little bit slower because now I have a toddler. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> we're, I'm just learning how that um, actually works, how I'm writing really, you know. But yes, I'm, I'm working on my next novel and I hope to definitely finish a draft this year and then we'll see. Well, I think that'll and be it, exciting, you know. Yeah, thank you. And it'll play in London again. Um, that's sort of... Because I'm not from London, but I've lived here for a long time, I think the city has a lot to offer for me because there's a lot of issues that you can place here that are pertinent here, but that are also universal to bigger cities. And so you can read them anywhere in a way. But it will be a bit more about mental health. Oh. Well, I'm very intrigued. I can't wait for your new book to be done. And we can have you back on the show to talk about it. Yes, that would be lovely. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, where can people connect with you and be part of your community? Um, the easiest is probably go via my website, which is my whole name, so olumidepopula.com. Um, and I have a Twitter handle, which is MS Olumide. So, um, but if you go to my website, all the links are there. And then you can see where I give reading, have readings or appearances as well. Well, I'm on your website. You can see all the great books that you've written, you know, and so it's nice to be able to um, connect with you and also become part of your community. I know I'm following you and I highly suggest everyone do the same and also pick up their own copy of When We Speak of Nothing. Alameda, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much for these great questions and for having me. Thank you, Alameda. It's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, When We Speak of Nothing. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.